Okay. Good afternoon, everyone who just coming out of the main panel now. Welcome to this uh, parallel session. Uh, the parallel session we have on this channel uh, will feature two topics. The first topic will be RR 4.0 skills training. We'll be talking about the com competence center for digitization, technology, and innovation. Um, after 45 minutes, we will have another session uh, in this room as well. It will be talking about um, the apprenticeship program um, and it will be featuring from Dr. Jacob from uh, University of Illinois and uh, Dr. Ronald Jacobs from, um, oh, sorry, um, Dr. Don Snyder from the CPT. Um, okay, good. So let's, okay, so let's feature, let's start off for the first topic. So as you might have heard, the Competitive Center for Digitalization Technology and Innovations, CDTI, is the first of its kind uh, company centers that provides training guidance and support to companies in Asian who wish to adopt transit and transform their process, technology, and organizational operations in the area of advanced digital manufacturing. In addition, CDTI also works closely with regional government agencies and Institute of Higher Learning on curriculum planning and development and the establishment of vocational training facilities. So we have two speakers for this topic, Dr. Marcus uh, and uh, Mr. Volker Smith. Uh, Dr. Marcus, Managing Director of the TUM Asia um, is the uh, TUM Asia is the subsidiary of um, Technical University of Munich uh, in Singapore. Um, Dr. Marcus has over 15 years of experience heading the institute, which was set up as the first German academic venue uh, venture abroad in 2002. And uh, Mr. Volker Smith, um, he also having an engineering degree in uh, metronomics and automation from um, Esslingen University in Germany. Um, he is currently holding the position of the director for Asia Pacific for the company of Festo Didactic, being the educational arm of Festo. Um, meanwhile. Mr. Smith is also part of the management team of the Competence Center for Digitalization Technologies and Innovation, uh, which was jointly set up by TUM Asia and the Festo Didactic in Singapore, addressing the current need of industry within the context of digitalization, smart manufacturing, and many more. So with, with no further ado, let's uh, Turn over to Dr. Marcus to speak uh, to start the presentation now. Welcome. Hey, thank you very much for the introduction. You covered most of it, so I can make it um, very short. Okay, so um, we have a few slides for you, so we will share the, the presentation. I start first. Um, next slide, please. So um, what we are talking about, my colleague and friend Volker and myself, is uh, the so-called CDTI, the Competence Center for Digitalization, Technology and Innovation in Singapore. And as you heard, the first tie up between um, TUM Asia, like the Singapore campus of uh, a German university and FESTO. And um, in, in the first of, I mean, even in Germany, the both entities never really co cooperated so closely. So here you see like a, a, a short screenshot. This is the entrance of our, of our center. So of course, most of the machinery is actually to the left around the corner, should you ever like um, come and visit us, which of course we, we all happily invite you. Um, next slide. Let me give you like a short overview. So as I mentioned, there are two partners. So 
I'm representing TUM Asia, the Singapore campus of TUM, one of Germany's leading universities. As you can see by the name, we are a, a technical university, so we are doing hardcore science and engineering. And around, around 20 years ago, we set up a campus in, in Singapore. Um, of course, we offer our usual degrees, bachelor, master, do research, PhD, all this kind of what every university does. But what um, sets us apart um, in Germany, actually, since its inception, TUM has a very entrepreneurial spirit. And also in Singapore for several years, we realized and understand the needs to do more and offer more than just our classical degree programs. Because the need, especially for people in the workforce, engineers, skilled workers, of course, is, is different now. So we're talking more about continuous education and training and not like in the past, one degree, and this will like be sufficient for the rest of your life, which of course we all know it's not the case anymore. So then from our side, we bring in the classical academic knowledge, the expertise in curriculum planning. Um, the good part about, especially the interesting and good part about TUM, what um, makes us the, the right partner for this is German universities have a, a long history of like working very closely with industry. And if you look at our teaching faculty that also comes to teach in Singapore, uh, most of them, if not all of them, have very close connection to our industrial partners. So we are very close to, let's say, the problems that are really happening outside in the, in the real, let's say, non-academic world. So that's our side. I want to keep our part here short, so I'm not talking much about the university. You can always read this up. And I hand over to my colleague Volker for a short introduction on, on Presto. Thank you very much, Markus, for the introduction. Well, um, Festo Didactic, obviously part of the Festo Group, worldwide present with more than 20,000 employees, mainly active in the industrial automation robotics field. Uh, we are one of the leaders in technical education and, of course, a global partner for competence development. Um, our focus uh, in general is technical education and training, including various topics uh, in, like uh, also TVET. Uh, we do inclusion training. Um, <clears throat> we also are very active in STEM, in bionics. I will not also go into further details here. Very interesting in our side is, of course, we are getting daily information from our industry arm. And we use this information from the industry in order to influence training solutions and also training programs. So we are well aware of the industry needs in the next three to five years. So we can directly use this information from the industry and define and develop future oriented training programs. Our learning solutions include, of course, courseware learning solutions, digital and also lifelong learning. Um, sometimes we call this also industrial workforce development and our key technology fields, as mentioned, is fluid power and factory automation, electrical engineering, industrial controls, industry 4.0, and renewable energy. And uh, by means of this occasion, I really want to thank the Singapore government, uh, because CDTI is also supported by the Economic Development Board. A big thanks to our excellence partner here. Back to Marcus, then. Okay, thank you, Volker. Let's go to the next slide. So let's talk a bit more about what CDTI is and what we are actually doing. So um, we are talking mostly about IR 4.0, industrial revolution, or industry 4.0, or whatever how you call it. Um, but this is, of course, not everything that we do in the center. But I think it's a good example to also give the participants a, a good overview of actually what this, this center is all about. So we set up planning for this center probably like two, two and a half years ago, so not too long ago. We started um, with the center more or less shortly before COVID hit us all. Um, so of course, also the center runs mostly virtual. So what is it about? So of course, education for us was always there. So we started executive education. We told you this before, but what we realized very quickly also when we talk to government agencies, to some partners, to, to companies, but also to trainees, participants. Um, it's definitely not sufficient to just have, for example, a training center. Because with a training center, you can, you can only address a very limited scope of the problems out there. So if you look at the, the, the chart here at the slide, what we are trying to implement or offer is more like a 
you can call it a, call it a 360 approach or a one-stop center. Of course, we do education. Of course, we also do what you can call professional, professional services or innovation. Some might call it even like um, consultation. Um, of course, what's also very important for us is, is, is collaboration. So what, what actually is it, what is the, the core of us? We have courses that we develop together with our partners, but also together with, for example, where we get inputs from the trainees. Also, when we come, when it comes about how do we train, it's not only that we say we have a fixed set of academia that comes and trains, which also clearly is not always the best trainer. So we might have trainers from academia, we have industry experts who join us and train if they have very interesting and relevant expert expertise. For certain cases, if you talk about I4.0, we invite, for example, first adopters, companies that like already like went through um, the I4.0 journey to a certain extent, and they then tell their story to like the, the interested newcomers. So we, we train, we very much want to um, build up a network between participants, trainers, other interested companies. Um, we, of course, we have hardware, which you saw in the, in the first slide. So it's training is in the past classroom training, but of course, always very important, hands-on training, especially what we're talking about here. So it doesn't, it's not sufficient just to like give the students or participants a video, some slides, a book. This is a part of it. At the end, they ideally have to come and like, um, let's say, get their hands dirty. And also the next step, what for us, what we realized might be then even more important, ideally after some kind of training, be it a few days, be it a few weeks, be it like um, an extensive course that, that has a few hundred hours, ideally then there should be some kind of problem statements coming out from this. That then participants, for example, from a company or like, um, trainers who come from schools, government institutions say, okay, fine, now we will learn this, but these are the problems, for example, that we are facing back in our workplace. How can we like apply and use some of the, the training and knowledge that we acquired here to go back and address our problems that we are having? And so, so of course, that we are also trying to like educate, train, but then also work together, advise, collaborate with them. And having a physical center, of course, could also be, for example, a kind of a test bed, a first step for companies where they say investing heavily in industry 4.0 equipment is way out of reach for like, let's say normal SMEs. We don't have the, the capex, we don't have the money to like buy the expensive equipment. Or, oh, but maybe we can try to work on some kind of joint project together. So we understand better, is it feasible for us or which parts of it is, is feasible. If I mean, if you talk about, especially also in the region about I4.0, then you have the, the benchmarks, you have the so-called Siri index that um, is, uh, has been developed in, in Singapore and is very good, but it's more like this is the first step. So you're like getting some kind of assessment. So maybe then you know where am I as a company? Am I at 1.5, 2, 3? Yeah, but this is only part of the equation. So how do I get from where I am now to maybe the next stage, A, how do I get there? But also even probably as important, if not more important to determine what stages do I want to take? Do I want to go all the way to what is supposed to be 4.0? Do I want to maybe go to 3.0 or 3.5? So this is where uh, even maybe more questions, at least this is our impression, more questions are opening up after the companies or the participants start to take the first steps in this um, industry 4.0 journey. And um, this is, I mean, we, we did training, of course, mostly in, in Singapore. We worked with some partners in some other ASEAN countries. Volker will share a bit more about this. And um, the, the problems, more or less, they're, they're always very similar and the same. So I think this is, um, this is then not um, unique for a specific country. So this is um, all over. Maybe um, briefly the, so I'm not going too deep in the in all the, the points here of, of the slides. You see this, but I think um, I just give you like a overall idea of really a center where people from different backgrounds, trainers, consultants, trainees, people who want to share, who have knowledge, who have expertise, ideally should should come together 
I mean, yes, get trained, train, but also do much more than this. And maybe we go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So um, as also from, from the first slide, so what we're actually having is a bit, can say either like a one-stop solution or everything that we're having ideally from a, from a single source. So um, yes, of course, the classical part, we do curricular design and planning. Of course, we also have experts. We have experts in-house who are really like um, physically located in the center and work there uh, five days a week. We have uh, extensive network of experts, colleagues also in Europe who in the past, of course, were flying in to, to Singapore um, to teach. Uh, nowadays, we, we often find, um, at least this is like, let's say, if I might say so, the advantage of the pandemic, because then we also realize how much is possible via Zoom and how open a lot of um, experts are to provide their expertise and their training via online classes. So of course, then you can do a very interesting and nice hybrid mix between physical classes and some kind of online teaching. So we do the um, curricular design, we also do assessment video. Of course, we have the training equipment. Part of it is also traveling around other Asian locations. Part of it is fixed and like um, really like on, on the ground in our center. So we have the, the proper infrastructure, which is also, as you see from the third picture, it's also very modular. So we are also flexible enough to address different problem sets. And um, this is also the, one of the key reasons why for us as a university, we uh, were very happy to partner up with Festo since this is more like what we always wanted to have, some kind of very modular, flexible kind of arrangements where we very quickly can um, rearrange, address new problems, different problem set equations for, for our students. Um, we also, for example, do one very classical thing, which is then called train the trainer. So not only that you say we want to um, um, just address companies. No, we are also more than happy to say, let's work with governments, schools, state bodies to say, yes, I mean, that we, we need to train all the, the multiplicators out there to bring it out to the different levels, speed on um, senior high school, university level, applied learning levels. I think this is also one of the key um, factors that we have to address. I think with this, my part of the presentation is already done and I hand over to, to Volker. Volker, please. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so here you see a bit of an overview uh, in more details what we are currently uh, offering uh, in terms of training from fundamental technology via mechatronics all the way up to industry 4.0. And on the left hand side at the bottom part, you also see some new courses that we have started. Marcus mentioned, for example, the Siri, uh, that's the industry readiness index from Singapore, but also now coming up in other countries which is also globally accepted by the world economic forum uh, so here we have also started to do some understanding trainings not only for companies but also for other training providers uh, who need to understand the importance of assessment before any digital journey will start and commence together with the uh, implementers very important also in the near future is more and more energy courses energy efficiency but also energy saving and um, uh, also a big topic uh, is, of course, cybersecurity, which we are confronted on a daily basis. So this is the overview of what we actually provide, more trainings to come, and also a lot of trainings which are currently not based on any job description. The reason is simple, because a lot of modern training topics like Digital Twin are not yet professionally reflected in job descriptions. So, if I only do training based on shop descriptions, I'm actually missing out a big portion on new technologies required by companies, as I said, energy efficiency, cybersecurity, and also digital twin. What we also look at is always uh, a bit of a holistic approach. Uh, we also talk a lot about learning experiences. Um, obviously, yes, we do have our own learning platforms. Uh, a lot of digital contents we do also at the same time virtual training. Uh, we also manage to do actually uh, digital installation and commissioning together with customers in case traveling, uh, and this is the case during the pandemic, is not possible. For us, very important is industry relevant. So we do not want to really touch uh, topics which are not of an 
industry relevance. May it be now, may it be in three years, may it be in five years, but important is always, how does the industry think about it? And when is the industry ready to implement it into the real environment? Marcus mentioned already face-to-face -face training um, is still important for us. Um, currently, of course, a lot of people, a lot of training providers are going digital, which is correct. Um, in particular, also the pandemic has shown us that yes, we need to offer digital training. But when we look only into Asia Pacific, we should not forget that there's a huge amount of teachers out there uh, who don't have a flat rate. Ministries are not paying the teachers their internet access. We have a huge amount of students who also do not have internet access or at least no flat rate. I mean, uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of our partners, customers, they have prepaid contracts. So we should not forget about um, all those ones. In particular, when we talk about TVET, there's a huge amount of students who may not have access to digital. So we also need to come up with still face-to-face -face solutions. Uh, we already have solutions, which are small industrial systems that are roaming around. So a community, of students can also still get real equipments, even though they are doing homeschooling. And this is something that I want to highlight here, even though it's not written specifically in the slides that digitalization is good, but we need to prevent not splitting the world into digital and non-digital. So here we still have a big and a, and a challenging way to go. Even ministries need to address this topic. How do they provide good internet access to teachers and likewise students as well? Marcus mentioned already, fast the ecosystem is of great importance. At the, at the lower part, at the second part of the slide, you see just an overview of a few uh, of our network partners. May it be from the educational side. Uh, Australia is there, Vietnam is there, China is there. But then on the right hand side, uh, you also see a lot of uh, companies, some may not be even known to you, but they are like Festo, certain hidden champions in their field. Uh, like, for example, in Singapore with Arkstone, Transplus, um, they are also even active in vertical farming, which is also a very interesting upcoming topic in the future. And without those partners and without working in the ecosystem, um, we are, would not be able to, to maximize the outreach to potential training providers uh, or even to the participants. On the lower side, um, you see also some governmental agencies. Uh, the majority is at the moment Singapore. That's also because CDTI has been set up in Singapore, but uh, definitely out of Singapore for the entire region of Asia Pacific. And one example is given. Um, we work also closely together with certain chambers of commerce and industry, uh, whereby we also offer jointly uh, industry 4.0 trainings. I mentioned already this may just be the beginning. Uh, in the future, we will definitely enlarge this network approach further. One success story, and I'm actually more than disappointed what's currently happening in Myanmar. Uh, but here is a good success story, which is SIDE, which is the School of Engine of Industrial Training and Education, a complete um, setup of an entire training center um, in the TVET area, not only addressing automation, uh, not only addressing Industry 4.0, but also addressing woodworking, for example. Um, and also here, the, the main aspect was are uh, to upgrade the skills with the main focus of hands-on training, um, which is of course uh, desperately required by companies in Cambodia, sorry, in Myanmar. Um, and yeah, we helped of course, uh, side we helped the ministry and also our partner in Myanmar, Siloin, to set up this training institution. Um, and now, uh, unfortunately it, it has come to a stop, but uh, I really, really hope that we can start soon again uh, whenever the situation eases up in the neighboring country of Myanmar. Coming to an end, um, I hope it was a short overview of our capabilities uh, between TUM Asia and Festo CDTI. Please feel free to visit the website. Um, just last week, we also launched our new training brochure uh, and we are happy to get in contact with you um, in various different areas uh, all across Asia Pacific. Um, and if you have any question now, I think we are good in time. 
or we have around 15 minutes for any question and answers. You may verbally ask questions or um, you may want to put them into the chat room. Maybe some of you can help me a bit or, or to also look a bit into the chat room in parallel. Thank you. We'll check Bennett Walker. Okay, um, I think we have a first question from Joselyn. Um, In a country where face-to-face -face training is not allowed, how can TVET skills learning continue? As I said, I mean, we also have solutions which is more or less learning out of a case, small technical applications where students can get the case, bring it to home, uh, do online virtual training together with this small kit, and then it's warming around so that uh, maybe a group of 30 students can share five or 10 of those kits and then it's warming. And then over a certain period of time, students can benefit still from a practical training. Obviously, um, a lot of topics are not really possible. I mean, if you think of welding, if you think of CNC, it's definitely not possible to share a CNC machine, but that is the challenge at the moment. We definitely need to see whenever there's an open window for face-to-face -face training, we should make use of it. Um, of course, uh, with all the measuring safety measures and then, you know, for some skills in TVET, yes, we have solutions, but for some skills, obviously, it is more than challenging. Okay. Sure. Marcus, should I take the second question? Yes, Marcus, that would be okay. So from Dilia from Kazakhstan, uh, what challenges did we face? Well, um, quite, quite a bit. I mean, of course, we are not the for sure the only one who wants to do something like this. So um, classical, you have to identify, I mean, you have to identify the, the niche, the market that you want to like address. What was um, very honestly the least or, or not a challenge at all was to like come to um, an agreement between Festo and Tomasia. So this was um, very quick that we realized we are on the, on the same page. We are also like um, complementing each other and not like competing with each other, which makes it very interesting. And it it was um, it was not so much of a challenge, honestly. So maybe of course Singapore um, is and has a very nice framework where it's it's rather clear whom we should talk to when we are looking for some kind of support, and it's um, it's easy to like approach the, the respective partners. And the challenges mostly, I think, started to came in when we. Um, started to roll it out, wanted to scale it up. And then COVID um, happened. And of course, there uh, was the big reset. But the center per se was um, rather, um, I wouldn't say smooth. I mean, there was a bit of challenges, but not so, not so serious. And I think the third one was for you, Volker, right? Where the yes, OK. We have Christopher Morada, or is learning, is Festo a learning platform or a repository platform? Uh, Festo is using our own solution, which is called Festo LX, uh, and it's even more than a learning platform. Uh, we call it an experience platform. Um, we support individual learning. That means you can also assign individual learning paths. Um, you have all the modern features of, uh, of an uh, EMS um, or an LMS. Um, so it's much more than this. You can even upload own contents, and this is also um, how we tackle, for example, some language barriers, or when there is a country where English is not widely spoken, teachers can easily upload their own training remarks, they can upload their own PDFs, so that the students can also benefit uh, from there. Further details, Festo LX, and you can also get a free access and look into this. Good. <coughs> I think the next one, connectivity gadgets, I think this is more for Festo probably. I would say. Well, connectivity and gadget should be useful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That one. Um, 
Well, the assistance might be a bit different. Um, nowadays, I mean, what, what we know, of course, from Singapore, for example, the government is supporting students. Uh, they can get uh, tablets, they can get even, I think, PCs. Um, however, Singapore might not be a good example because it's a smaller country and a rich country uh, within Asia Pacific. Uh, I know from Indian schools, they are also providing uh, some locally Indian made uh, HTC, for example, tablets, um, just to make sure that the students really have access. <coughs> I mean, what uh, to, to add on to this, what of course we are also like, that's why Volker also brought up the example where we work with the AHK in Myanmar. So this is also an example where we, uh, I mentioned we have some equipment that is modular. So we also bring some of the, the training equipment on site, not of course the whole industry for Print Zero Center, but some kind of smaller modules. And of course, this could gives us the possibility to, for example, travel to the to Philippines or Cambodia or Laos, wherever, and have some kind of decentralized training to a, to a certain level. Of course, we then cannot like um, travel to, to every city, but uh, we definitely can like um, go across a bit and try to bring some of the technologies to the participants. Since I, I uh, fully agree, this is a very good and, and valid question. Okay, um, I see another one addressed to Festo. Dear speakers, what are impact of Festo learning platform in the skilling or uh, in the use of technology? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, digital, of course, um, whenever face-to-face -face training is not possible during a pandemic, uh, obviously digital learning still makes sense. However, um, when we talk about physical touch points, and this is face to face, this may be pushed towards the end. Um, when people or students use digital tools and they come back to the classroom, obviously what we expect is the knowledge is more homogeneous. That means we anyway can reduce the physical touch point time uh, because we do not need to talk about safety aspects most likely. We do not need to cover a lot of physical fundamentals to understand the system. So we can jump right into the topic um, to even start working with the machines. Another, uh, another solution that we are doing, for example, in the field of PLC programming, uh, students can still program the PLCs at home and then they can um, use some remote labs that we have. Um, and then they can apply also this PLC program on the real system and by means of cameras, uh, they can still see the reaction of the machine. So this is also what we are doing globally. Um, unfortunately, not yet in Asia Pacific, but we do it in Switzerland, for example, whereby there are uh, also institutions which rent a, a, a hardware uh, laboratory to the students from time to time. I want to keep it short. Uh, please contact us and we can get into further uh, details. Yeah. I mean, there, there's one question on what kind of courses are we training? Uh, courses are we offering, sorry. I mean, actually it's, it's, quite, it's quite wide. So of course we start from like, starting from pneumatics, like more than the basics, uh, uh, which is covered up to like specific courses in like industry 4.0 and um, how this also changed specific industries. So it's, um, it's a rather wide, wide field up to of course like data related courses. I think the best um, that, um, Either you go to our homepage or that we also make, maybe we can make the, the, the course brochure like available for people to, to take a look where, where this is um, currently displayed. But also, of course, one thing has to be also what I want to emphasize. Um, we are also very much working then with specific partners to understand specific training needs. So there is a set of courses that are already out there, but this is always like being evolved and further developed where we say, of course, if there's like specific needs and demands, then we are always open to say, maybe we just like fine tune and tailor made additional courses to um, specific clients needs. Oh, and Volker, anyway, thank you Volker, shared the, the link to our brochure where then you can also just have a, have a closer look on the courses. I mean, since they also vary, so some are maybe like just a, let's say a very short introduction, a few hours, half a day, a day, up to the biggest courses, which is a certificate, which call, which is like close to 300 hours a year. So this is this is the other end. So of course, and then people can choose. Will CDTI help to set up training centers in other countries? Um, 
of course, we are, we are open since, I mean, Singapore for us was the, the starting point since we as a university are based in, in Singapore. Um, but if we look about the, the long-term demand and needs, for sure there is probably more than enough need and demand in, in other countries. And we already have preliminary talks with some potential partners in some other ASEAN countries where either we, we export some of our training overseas or depending on the size, partner up with, of course, ideally probably partner with someone in a country, I don't know, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, or somewhere else and say, let's um, do something um, together. Then there was one question from Vivian. I think this is more from, should be for me. What is your thought about a university being industry driven? I think we can discuss what industry, I mean, this discussion probably can take us until, I don't know, 7 p.m. Um, I, I think the university, most universities, universities should, of course, have some connection to the industries, especially, let's say, for the, the technical field, since, to be honest, this is where the graduates, anyway, should go and end up. So we, anyway, need to ensure that the skills that we are training are relevant and give the, the students and the graduates to the right skill set. And of course, also getting them the right questions that are then coming out from industry, helping us to work on applied research with together with industry. So this is very natural and this is what we are doing, especially in TUM and in Germany for a while. Of course, it's a, yes, we have to strike a balance and it, it can't be that we are just, let's say, the extended training arm of the industry and um, the HR department of a big company tells us this is the graduates that we need. And then maybe in three, four, five years, this changed. And then the HR companies tell us, HR departments tell us, oh, maybe now you change the skill sets again because we need something else. And the people who are suffering are then the graduates. So um, I think this, this needs to be a balance that there should be a um, communication, yes. And probably in the past, universities or in Parts still like this. Universities love to we love to like stay in our ivory tower and talk about um, our ranking and our um, highly cited research, and then we lose a bit the contact to um, what's happening, let's say, on, on the ground. So that there needs to be a bit of a balance. But the industry, of course, can also not really command the universities what to what to do. And I think I also ended. And it here since I guess we have five or six more minutes before the next presentation. I think let me add one more thing, Marcus. Here, I think we need to differentiate what kind of university are we talking about. I mean, sure. um, in Germany we have the so-called universities. We need we need to differentiate about between research universities. Um, we have universities of applied sciences, and then we have even a dualistic university model. So whenever it comes to the university closest to industry, I would always say this is the dualistic university model. It works like a TVET. Students go to school and stay in the company. Um, and this is the same with the university model, which we call dualistic university model. Students are assigned, are attached to the company. They are being paid by the company. And over a period of five years, they can also obtain a bachelor uh, degree. Um, and normally they stay in the company. We also do this in Germany as Festo. Um, and uh, of course, we also have a close cooperation with the so-called University of Applied Sciences. For Festo, I can say, uh, eight out of 10 new hirings from the university level are coming out of those two kind of universities, University of Applied Sciences, as well as the dualistic university. Research driven universities, unfortunately, our hirings are a bit lower, um, but that's part of our company's nature, but that's just a, an add on to what you have been discussing. I hope now we have covered most of the questions. We still have two, three minutes left. If somebody still has one more question, please feel free to type it in the chat room. Okay. There's a one more question. How can you okay. do skills assessment and evaluation remotely? Okay. Um, we have another we have another parallel session in case you missed it. Uh, 
you can see the recording and this is a good friend of mine and a business partner tim miller uh, he's now presenting uh, for example certif id certif id is providing digital certificates based on blockchain um, and it works like you need an assessment partner who assess who is assessing the school itself um, and when we talk about an assessment i mean there's not only an assessment on the teachers it must be also an assessment on the machinery. There must be also an assessment on the environment. Um, and of course, we also need to see what is a kind of national and a, and a regional ranking of their curriculars. When this is well in place, then uh, uh, like companies like uh, Certif ID uh, will onboard the partners onto their network and then uh, we can remotely uh, issue digital certificates Likewise, companies like Festo, we can also hire remotely, which we also do. Um, of course, we need to trust the platform or we need to trust the information which is given there. But first of all, when we receive such a digital certificate or you scan the QR code, a website pops up cross-checking. Um, of course, there's the, the blockchain working in the background and then they give you the result is okay. This student has done these courses at this institution, all certified, uh, and we can guarantee that this digital certificate has its validity. And this is how we can then also do our assessment remotely. But of course, uh, we need to have some, um, some physical steps uh, as well, because uh, simply, uh, certifying uh, remotely an institution is very difficult in particular to assess the environment. Um, a lot of advantages here because we can also then, a digital certificate can also have a timestamp. For example, when it's security relevant skills, you just, yeah, you have to update them year by year. This can be all done by issuing these uh, digital certificates. We also partner with, for example, CertifID. Um, feel free to get in contact with Tim Miller uh, very interesting, very huge network. And also Tim can tell you more how he has brought a person from India, for example, into employment into Germany, which is almost impossible to believe. But that's in short, what is remote assessment and also what is remote, um, yeah, even remote hiring. Maybe quickly, the last question on courses in cybersecurity digital twin. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think we have anyway different levels. So of course we also have introductory courses, which should be then okay for people who are fresh out of school. And of course, then we have also like longer, more detailed courses where you might need, of course, specific like um, prerequisites or like pre like knowledge in in specific areas. But we are also offering um, courses that um, address different different crowds. So it's not like every um, IT or cyber course is only for IT specialists. Also very clear where we also understand we should address different crowds on different on different levels. And I think with this, since our colleagues from the US are already like um, ready to um, go and run, I think um, the Germans talked enough today. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Then. So uh, thanks, uh, really, thank you very much, Dr. Marx and uh, Mr. Volker. Uh, you managed time really well as well. I think we're right, right on the, uh, you know, 40, 45 minutes mark. Um, like you said, our, um, you know, friends in the US is really getting uh, into late hours. Um, we really appreciate um, the, you know, um, the opportunity for Dr. Uh, Rona Jacobs, as well as um, you know, Mrs. Uh, actually, Dr. Down Snyder um, uh, from Snyder Associates coming in today uh, to set up start up our next session around apprenticeship programs. Um, it features a blend of classroom instruction in a training institution and on the job training in an employer setting. Uh, a quick introduction to Dr. Uh, Jacobs. Uh, it's a professor of, uh, is a professor of University of Illinois um, and the, uh, in the human resource development. Also uh, a principal, the principal of Situate, a, a digital version of structure on the job training. Um, Dr. Javis has authored over 100 journal articles and book chapters and has authored 
or edited six books that address a range of topics in human resource and workforce development. Uh, Dr. Jacob is also uh, particularly known for his research and consulting related structure on the job training, SOJT. Um, Dr. Jacobs also has consulted extensively with organizations, government ministries, non-governmental, as a member of the Smaller Academy of Human Resource Development. Also, uh, Dr. Don Snyder, founder of the Don Snyder Associates. Um, she is the founder of Down Snyder Associates, a learning and performance firm that provides consulting on learning strategies, curriculum architecture, performance assessment, and evaluation. Dr. Snyder has a proven track record of bringing practical cutting edge solutions to our organizations who want to take performance to the next level. She's also passionate about supporting emerging uh, talent and has worked in universities and corporations to build curricula and teaching programs that credential high performance individuals. Welcome Dr. Snyder and Dr. Jacobs. I believe Dr. Jacobs will, will start first. I'll hand over to you to start the presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with my colleague, Don Snyder. And um, there's our presentation. As you can see, we're interested today in talking a little bit about apprenticeships and looking at how we might be able to improve the relationship between the training institutions and the employer relationship. Next, please. And so I think we have a few more slides than we actually need, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood that we are not presenting a case study about apprenticeships, but we are discussing here today about how to make those relation, the relationship, the key relationship between the employer and the training institution perhaps more effective. And to give you a little bit of background about what is structured on the job training. You've probably heard of that training approach before. And then to also introduce to you a digital platform that I think also addresses some of the questions that were posed in the previous presentation as well. So I think there's a great deal of complementary interests between the previous pr presentation and the one that we're going to do here. Next, please. These are some of our goals for today, but um, as I say, we probably have a few more slides than we actually need, so we'll go on from that. Next, please. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dawn, and she's gonna talk just a little bit about what's happening in our trends as all of us understand them changing right now. Thanks, go ahead, Dawn. Thank you, Ron. And so, like Ron said, we just want to make sure that we're setting the stage and getting everyone on the same page as we, we funnel down to the area of interest today. I think all of you are aware of, of these trends. And I think the notable thing is to note that the pandemic may have accelerated some of them. These have all been in, in play for some time. But the very interesting thing, I think, is thinking about how the trends impact the work that we do. Um, these are a few pieces of information that we, we think are very interesting. Um, and again, these are all within your areas. These are things that you see, um, you know, the focus on remote work, um, the digital transformation and, and new jobs. One of the things that's really interesting about all of these trends is that they cause employers to shift people from jobs that are no longer as relevant to, to being able to do work that is relevant right now. And so never in the history of, of, of time have we seen the need for so much skilling and upskilling in order to uh, keep organizations productive. And I think that's where we wanna land on this is uh, focusing on how 
we all work together to meet the needs and, and we're very solution focused in our presentation today in terms of thinking about the fact that skills development is really key to national productivity. So it's worth a lot of time and effort and figuring out new ways um, to address this particular situation um, with the focus not only on uh, development of new skills, but as I said before, taking these workers who will be displaced and making sure they have the skills to be relevant in today's workplace. One of the things that's near and dear to my heart related to that is being sure that we're doing a very good job identifying what people need to know and do. Um, I think in the previous presentation, it was mentioned that, you know, if you look at job descriptions, you don't always uncover what the current and future needs are because things are changing so very quickly. So um, being able to identify what people need to know coming to some sort of agreement on what that is and using that as the basis for preparation to do work is really critical. Another thing that is important about what we need to do in order to meet needs is really to um, develop these skills in a real context. You know, I think a lot of folks want to move people away from the training situation in order to give them uh, skills, and that can work. But if we can train people right in the workflow, right on the job, we're able to reduce the time to value. We're giving them the actual experience of the work that they need to do so that they are more, more quickly productive in the work that needs to be done. And we also remove any of those barriers uh, of transferring training from a classroom type situation to where it's applied in the workplace. We just remove those barriers. So developing skills in a real context is an area that, that we really pay a lot of attention to. And then another thing that we've been um, focusing on in terms of solutions is being able to streamline training processes. So, you know, when you're coming up to create a curriculum, you have to look at, uh, you know, the analysis that you're going to do to figure out what goes in it. You have to look at the development in terms of creating those materials so you can get them in front of uh, workers or learners. And you also have to think about how you're going to maintain that curriculum because whatever you prepare today is going to change very quickly. So one of the focus areas that we work on is how do we streamline those training processes to make those distinctions between figuring out what we're going to do, getting it in front of the students and keeping it sustainable, um, make that as seamless as possible. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ron. Thank you, Don. Next slide, please. When we talk about apprenticeships, and that will be the focus of the remaining comments, apprenticeships and also structured on the job training. You know, there's many stakeholders in this process, but the major stakeholders obviously is the one that I like to think about are, is the relationship between the training institutions, the schools, whatever they might be, post-secondary schools, um, and also the employers, the people who receive the trainees. And, you know, this is a, a relationship that's very critical for the success of the apprenticeship program. But we also know that each of the stakeholders within an apprenticeship system have goals of their own. They have their key processes that they engage in. Obviously, schools and industries, employers have different processes, and they're looking for different outcomes as well. But still, we believe in the apprenticeship system because it, it is, as Don said, it's critical for the economic development of any society. If you look at that, next slide, please. If you look at the keys for success of most any apprenticeship program, I've listed some of these here, and I'll do this very, very quickly. But you know, in a descending order, you can say that when a relationship is successful, the curriculum of a program is based on a standard of some kind, whether it's a national standard or a, a business standard or what, that the second bullet shows that the courses are based on the knowledge and skill requirements from the standard, that the standard is adapted to the jobs in the region and the employers that are receiving the students, that the apprentices receive a training plan 
based on some kind of job analysis that was done with the employer. The task analysis is conducted on critical tasks. I'm not sure if many of these things, if, if you can realize how important all of these things are. That the apprentice receives formal training based on the tasks within the employer setting. And then the apprentice completes the training plan and re receives some kind of endorsement of what they've accomplished. This is just a list of things that, you know, from a perfect system of what might be the keys for success for the relationship between an employer and a training institution. But in reality, if you change a slide, we know that it's not always the same. The program curriculum may be based on a standard. The courses are not likely always to be based on the requirements from that standard. I have done quite a bit of consulting with technical institutions and know that to be true. And that's just the fact that, you know, unfortunately we work from. Um, and the connection between what happens in the work employer setting and in the school setting, oftentimes there's a disconnect between them. And apprentices don't always have a training plan. And you can scan that list and you can look at the bottom. And we know for a fact that apprentices often are uncertain what has been accomplished at the end for a variety of reasons. And I'm not saying this is being critical on either one of the stakeholders, but it's just a fact of how, because they have differing goals, each of the stakeholders, and they have differing processes and they have differing outcomes of importance to them. Go ahead and change, please. Thanks. So, you know, when we think about the issues with apprenticeship systems, we can kind of then change the track of our thinking here and just think about traditionally when we think about structured on the job training, because structured on the job training has often been used as a means to deliver apprenticeship programs in the past. And as you can well imagine, SOJT is features people learning in the actual workplace, but it's different from most OJT, it's planned. And I'll share with you a little bit more information of how that makes a difference in just a minute. Much of the research that I've done in the past, I can't say how many years, I'll be a little bit coy and shy about that, but we've shown quite a bit convincing evidence to show that SOJT compared to unstructured on the job training and classroom training has greater efficiency and effectiveness. And if anybody's interested in some of the research, I'd be very more than uh, willing to share that with you. And but we also know that what's best whenever we use SOJT is that when there's a close match between the learning and the doing. Next, please. You may be familiar with some books that I've written on the topic, Structured on the Job Training was 2003. And I have a new book that some of you might be interested in in 2019 about work analysis. So the people, uh, if you're interested in how to do a job analysis, occupational analysis, task analysis, and those kinds of things, there's a book, you can find those on any of the online booksellers. Next, please. My definition of structured on the job training is basically is that it's a plan process that involves an experienced employee and a novice employee, which would be the person, the trainee, and a unit of work, which might be what we would call a task or an assignment or some kind of unit that has unit of work that has a beginning and an end. And of course, it occurs in the actual work setting. And these are the five key elements that I think about when I think about structured on the job training. Now, when we think about this, it can be applicable in the employer setting, but it could also be applicable in the lab setting within the, the training institution as well. So SOJT has been used in both of those instances. Next, please. I'm gonna skip this, this slide here in the interest of time, so we have more time for discussion. So why don't we go to the next slide? As I said earlier, one of the things that I have focused on in my academic career has looking at both with my students and my partner organizations that I've worked with, um, the idea of training efficiency. Training efficiency is whether or not SOJT 
decreases or reduces the length of time that's required to learn. And if that's true, what is the cost savings, the benefit of doing that? And the other um, focus of the research has been on training effectiveness. In other words, do people do a better job after they've learned through SOJT? And that's also been viewed quite a bit. And if you're interested in more about some of the studies that we've done on these two topics, please contact me and I'm more than willing to share with you some of the things that we've done. So we know in, in a general sense, the effectiveness of SOJT and its importance for organizations. Next, please. And just as a, a quick brief, um, you know, in the past 30 years or so, SOJT obviously has been used in many companies, both nationally here in the US and globally. And it's been used in a number of national agencies, workforce development agencies. For example, in South Korea, there has been a great deal of emphasis on using SOJT with small and medium-sized enterprises. And also in Singapore, they've had in the past the OJT 2000 initiative. And so many different um, countries have included it as part of their national workforce development programs. Apprenticeship programs obviously are a natural for SOJT. And then also, we've also seen SOJT being used by NGOs, for example, in the healthcare industry, healthcare services providers and things like that. So there's been a, a, a spread of different types of organizations that have made use of SOJT. Next, please. Thank you. So, you know, as we have changed in the work, the workplace has changed as Don has referred to and work has changed over time as we have seen. And as Don said, it has, the changes have accelerated quite a bit too is that the question, and I think uh, uh, two people or two or three people referred to this point in the earlier presentation, what can we do about face-to-face -face training or skills development training in the area, where, in an era when we really can't be face-to-face -face anymore that much as before? And so when you think about a digital version of SOJT, um, the critical criteria for us was that it had to have the key points for SOJT that made it successful. As Don referred to, you have to think about how to make the training process, how to make the entire design process and delivery seamless so it's easy to use and that it's flexible, that you can use it in person, face-to-face, -face, or in a digital sense as well. As any kind of digital platform, the whole goal is not to make things more complicated, but it's the, the, an attempt to make things more easy. And that's what we've tried to do. And plus we've made some value added components too. Next please. So um, what we have, we have developed a platform called Situate. And I invite you to go look at the website. Uh, we have tried to migrate all of our resources either to the website situate-training.com or also to our YouTube channel that you can find just by searching and you can find Situate there. And we have a number of clips that give a narrated demo of the platform, shows you how it works and everything. And you can see the, the YouTube uh, channel is listed below. Um, next, please. This is the uh, dashboard, and you can see if you were to use Situate, you would find that there's a dashboard that allows privileges for the trainees to enter, for the trainers, for the developers of the materials and things like that, and also for managers. And the reason it seems that Situate seems so appropriate for apprenticeship programs is that it allows both sides to enter, the training institution and also the employer to be able to make use of, the, of what's on it. Let me show you what you can do on Situate on the next slide here. For example, it tries to make everything easier for you. And these are the headings that were on the dashboard. So it allows you to do using templates. It allows you to do a job analysis. It's integrated that when you identify the tasks, you can do a task analysis. 
There's a process in there that will give you the ability to do a skills gap analysis where you're comparing two job analysis charts and identifying tasks that have changed. Also an occupational analysis as well. And it, it's seamless when you identify the tasks, you can do the task analysis, it's integrated in that way. And when you do the task analysis, then it integrates and then it pre-fills for you to do, to develop a training guide the thing that you would use, the trainer and the trainee would use during the deliveries. So you can see that the trainer guide, the trainee, and there's an onboarding template in there as well, and also an embedded train the trainer program as well. The whole point of this, as you can see training and meetings, is that you can, through the embedded Twilio or Zoom or any other uh, real-time communication, you can deliver training remotely. You can have the trainee in the work setting, you can have the trainer in another work setting separate from each other. And then there's a management component to, to this as well, where the, there's a training plan that you can develop. Interestingly, what we've done is that the training, the tasks that you identify when you analyze the job pre-fill into the training plan for the trainees so that all of that, there's accountability for that. And finally, e evaluation. And uh, the, the financial analysis, the return on investment approach that I use will be embedded, is embedded within the situate. This is a very brief overview of this and I'll, we'll take some questions later. Next, please. So, you know, the, as I say, uh, one person that has been interacting with us has described situate as being a meeting point between the training institutions and the employers. And because there has to be an occupational analysis and also a job analysis that connects with the employer, it brings the employers and the schools together for planning. It provides a training plan for the students. It provides a methodology for the employers to use because many times students go out to the employers and the, 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 and the employer really doesn't know what to do with that student, how to make that training occur. And I believe as we've moved forward is that we are providing more accountability for the entire apprenticeship and learning experience. And so uh, at this point, I'm gonna stop and turn it back over to um, Don and we can make some comments and but go to the next slide, Don, if you would, uh, we can maybe rest on that one. Because I'll just mention to everybody that we are engaged right now in developing some pilot projects with institutions and employers globally. And so this is something for us to think about if you're interested in maybe later on contacting us. Okay, thank you very much. Don, go ahead. So let me go ahead and stop the share. There have been some comments coming in in the chat, Ron. I don't know if you can see those. I have not seen those, no, great. Okay. I'll have to scroll up. Um, I'm going to maybe go through those. SOJT is not the same as shadowing because many times shadowing is unstructured. Shadowing many times means I'm just looking over the person's shoulder. But you know, as you can see now from the presentation, SOJT is about identifying the units of work within a job or an occupation and identifying how to analyze those units of work and making sure that people can perform those behaviors. So it's not, not really quite the same. Um, yes, uh, I am easy to find. You can uh, find me either through the University of Illinois email address or situate, and I'll be happy to send documents to you if you're interested, articles. Uh, yes, uh, experienced employee. I use the word experienced employee and not an expert because well, we all know that even today, uh, an expert means something a little bit different from an experienced. Um, so experienced employee, but the, the experienced employee must also be somebody that's qualified to be a trainer anyway. Um, well, you know, one of the things about industry buy-in is that people, employers have always asked, why should I do this? Now, in, in uh, countries like Germany, they have a long history of the private sector participating in the public sector for the public good. The point that I always make when I talk to employers about apprenticeship programs is that they get access 
by using SOJT or now they, they can use Situate, they get access to a training approach that they, they haven't used before. So the benefit for them, besides the benefit of having another employee, is being able to have something that they might be able to use for their own employees as well. Um, um, you know, the difference between unstructured and structured OJT is pretty clear. All of us probably have experienced unstructured on the job training at some point in our careers where we've just been walking around following somebody expected to learn more or less by watching somebody else do it. Um, yes, I'm looking at uh, uh, Naron's. Um, yes, uh, it tends to be, you know, many times even the training institutions have difficulty because of new technology, understanding exactly what are the requirements for a particular unit of work or the things that you expect students to do in a class. It's a struggle and it's a continuing struggle. And that's why one of the issues that um, uh, is of importance is to understand that continuing process of documenting. Um, Christopher, I'm not sure when I think about soft skills, I think about soft skills. It, when I think about soft skills, I also think about what um, you know, people involved in relationships and things like that. But I, SOJT still works best when you're thinking about units of work with an outcome. And if there's an outcome to it, whether you call it soft skills or whatever you call it, I don't use that term very much. But uh, if there's an outcome to the unit of work, then it works best with SOJT. SOJT is one of the most frequently used training approaches used by organizations today. And so most organizations, especially organizations in high risk um, or high consequence business sectors um, are committed to using SOJT because of maybe the quality management requirements that they have. Um, boy, that's a, a good question for my friend, Zen. Thank you for the, <laughs> thank you for the most difficult question on the list, <laughs> Zen. Um, that um, I can only say that, you know, SOJT, I think takes a, increases the objectivity, the ability for any trainee to succeed. And I think that's a, a critical, a critical aspect. I'll make one last comment about that. I did a large project in Kuwait with the, in the petroleum sector with Kuwait National Petroleum Company, and they adopted SOJT for new hire engineers when the new engineers were coming in. And if you're interested in this uh, project that I'm describing to you, I have a case study that was published and I can send you that article. But for the first time, there were women engineers who served as trainers to new hire male engineers, new hire engineers. And so they would have never had the opportunity in the previous system to be part of the development of the next generation of engineers in their company. Um, you may have these slides um, and um, it's either available through the uh, Asian, the sponsors of the program, or of course, we can also send you the slides. So please contact me. It'd be easier. I know some people are giving me their email address, but it'd be easier for either you to send it to me or to Don, and we will respond. I think I did everything. <laughs> are there any other questions? This is, this is a big topic, I know. And the, and the reason it's a big topic, as Don had mentioned, is the skills development that's the demand for skills de development and um, if any of you are on the univoke blog this idea of it keeps re reoccurring about how do we get f skills training in the time of pandemic people can't come together as they have before we can't be face to face how do we do this and if we're going to use these digital platforms it's got to be based on the type of things that have been successful in the past. We can't expect online learning alone the way it's been presented to be able to give us skills development. Ron, can you say a few words about Situate and, and how to use it virtually? 
because that is one of the advantages of the platform. Yeah, you know, the Situate, um, as I said earlier, it's meant to give the same characteristics, the features of structured on the job training. And it's also um, gives you some additional features and to make things easier for people so that people can, you know, and this would be from the school, the training institution perspective for the most part, in their ability to analyze the work that, that uh, students are going to be learning, whether it's from a job or from an occupation perspective, and to make that process a lot more seamless. One of the things that um, is in critical, is very critical for many employers, is that when you, if the Situate platform, if you do a job analysis and you do a task analysis, and you, from that information, you have training modules for the trainee and the trainer, and then it goes into a performance check, and then it goes to a training plan for the trainee, if you can follow the logic and all that. But if something should change, and if you start upstream again, and if you change something in the task analysis, the system will automatically adjust everything after that. And for many people in organizations, not to have to go through all those documents to update things manually is a huge advantage so that you don't have all these different variations of different training documents moving around and things like that. Yes, Jocelyn, there is at the end of each of the training um, activities, we call them a training guide or a training module, there is what we call a performance check. And I'm glad you asked the question because the performance check feature can either be done live. So for example, if the trainer is observing the trainee live, they can, that person can observe the trainee and, and complete the performance check. Or the trainee can record himself or herself and that can be viewed later. Or the performance check can be based on submitted and downloaded documents. Now, the other aspect of, uh, so there's multiple ways for that performance check to be done. Plus, Situate has the ability to do multiple raters. So the, the trainer could be a raider, a, an evaluator can be a raider, and also a manager could be a rater as well. So, you know, there's some flexibility in terms of how that assessment can occur. Um, well, in an offline situation, you would probably want to download and print out all the documents and then deliver the training by itself. But, but since everything is cloud-based, I'm afraid you're kind of stuck with some kind of connectivity. Thank you, thank you, Zen. So the other element I think that came up in the chat was about scalability. And when you, one of the things that we find folks are really interested in the platform is it's very hard to get consistent results um, if you don't have this kind of support because you can then take a program and grow it uh, because the system kind of, organizes all that information and, and makes the flow easier. So it is easier to scale to a larger group of people. I like um, Sean Shu's uh, comment there about at-risk students, because I think, again, I think through uh, SOJT and I, you know, I call Situate the digital version of SOJT, but I think what it does, it gives access to people in an objective way so that um, you can make sure that everybody can receive the training. And one of the things, um, you know, when you're developing the materials, the training guides and analyzing the tasks, you can use the templates that embed, that's embedded, but if there's some disabilities that you have to be accommodating, that's the way to identify within the context of the task analysis. So let me ask the audience, did we miss anything in the chat that you would like to, um, to re-ask? <laughs> or is there something else that's come up? 
As, as I said earlier, we are uh, working with some apprenticeship both here in the US and some global ones and putting together the, the we've been in the market for only about three months. And so we are very anxious to um, work with people. And we especially like the apprenticeship because of its net, if it, of its economic development and its workforce development implications, um, if that's possible. As I said earlier, I'll make a, maybe wait for somebody else to make a quest, ask a question. But you know, Situate allows both the employer to to use the system from their direction to to for the training institution to use it, and also for, also for the trainee to find out about how they're doing too. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mary. You know, I'm not sure if I'm catching your question exactly, but one thing that's that's critically important is the the realization that many institutions, training institutions, work from a curriculum development from their uh, from an occupational analysis, either from a national scale or from the within the business sector or whatever. But we also know that that national occupational standard or the occupational standard in general has very little relevance actually with employers. And so this is um, important within the context of Situate to be able to take those occupational standards and adapt them to the employer situation. And I think that's one of the benefits that you get from Situate is that you're able to make that occupational standard, which was the basis of your instruction of the program and make it connect with the employer's use of that occupation. Um, you mean, Kenny, do you mean um, in terms of outcomes? We, we have not done, um, if you're interested in a, one of the leading, leading NGOs that I found that uses N SOJT, there's an um, NGO by the name of Engender Health, E-N-D-E-R-G-E-N-D-E-R, -E -E engenderhealth.org, I guess it is, but they're an NGO that focuses on women's health issues. And they have been using SOJT as a means to train health field workers, people out in the field to do certain things, to work with women one-on-one, one-on-three -on -one, one -on and stuff like that. And we are starting a project now in Ethiopia, believe it or not, to develop a digital platform for the SOJT that they use. And, um, but it, uh, go look on Engender Health. Um, and it's, it, so they, that's an example of an NGO that has been using, but we have not done any research with S NGOs. That's unfortunate. Thank you very much, John. I believe this session is being recorded so it can be looked that you can view any of it. It does say we are being recorded. Yes, the session is recorded and it will be put okay. on the event website uh, right after uh, tomorrow. You're going to see this recorded session for anybody who can go to the website and uh, see any of the recorded videos for our parallel sessions. Thank, thank you, Sean. Uh, the, and there's a question there about uh, in the system, um, there's a capability for the system, not only for the, that saves, that updates the training plan for the uh, individual trainees or students, but there's also a training audit. And what that means is that somebody can come in and they can see the progress of the entire group. So from an employer perspective, they can identify which trainees have completed, who are available to perform certain tasks. And from the school perspective, they can go in and see the progress of all the apprentices relative to the tasks. But something like that is, I'm certain, not very difficult to customize within the, um, within the platform. The, the platform developer you might be interested in knowing is located actually in the US. Uh, it's not, um, the IT staff are here in the US in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio. And so 
um, that's our partner for Situate. Could be, um, I'm looking at, uh, it, uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, you know, if, there, if the um, OD consultants are involved in job analysis or some kind of, uh, one thing I didn't mention really quickly, I'll mention is that embedded in the system in the work analysis part is the skills gap analysis um, component too. So that, for example, a school, a training institution and an employer could sit down and identify a job title and they can look at where is that job in terms of the duties and the tasks currently. And then they can ask the, a different prompt question, where will this job be in some specified time, two years from now? What's the forecast for this job? And the system will align so that you can look at two sets of a job analysis chart and then identify the tasks that change and give you a template for an action plan of how you're going to address what you're going to be doing with those tasks. And um, from a digital perspective, it allows the trainer, the employers and the training institutions to come together on the screen and to be both looking at these documents at the same time. If anybody's interested in that, we did a project uh, a year and a half ago now, uh, just before the pandemic hit in Chicago with five uh, small, medium-sized manufacturing companies and did a demonstration project of how skills gap analysis can be addressed in that way. Um, I don't know if it's feasible for an individual, but you know the, the fee for Situate is based on time, not by the number of trainees or things like that. But, you know, from our perspective, our goal right now is to get as many users as possible and get the experiences back from how they use it. Thank you, Don. <laughs> These are great questions. I really appreciate appreciate the questions. Um, you know, we've been working also had discussions with Simeo uh, in uh, Phnom Penh. And um, so I see that you're with Innotech, Jocelyn. The Simeo TED Technical Education Division. We have been discussing uh, doing pilots with ADB. And so if anybody's interested in it being involved in a pilot, please let us know. And please let me know or Don know. And because next week we're going to be having discussions with uh, ADB about um, this is a priority for ADB apparently to help training institutions have a better relationship, a more productive relationship in their apprenticeship programs. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. A group picture, I love these group pictures. I think we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so very much, everybody. And yeah. from my perspective, good morning um, <laughs> and good afternoon. Can we can we have all the four speakers, uh, you know, turn on your mic, uh, turn on your camera, and at least we have the our uh, four speakers. I don't know. Yep, yep. Yeah, we have the German and the U.S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, okay. okay. Um, and kind of three. I just. Put your big smiles. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. One more, just for safety. Okay, there. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Great. It's a perfect timing. So we're at six, so we're closing off. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this. And thanks, big thanks to especially our U.S. Uh, you know expertise for staying up this late. This is already morning time for you. I think it's, a, it's a, a time to get up, but now really, uh, you know, thank you for spending the time here and uh, for, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Volker and uh, Marcus as well. 
uh, thank you for attending and uh, all the participants. Uh, don't forget to come back tomorrow for our higher education session. It start at 2 p.m. Um, Manila time and uh, look forward for your participation again tomorrow and the day afternoon. We have two more days left for this week's uh, you know, event and uh, the ninth International Skills Forum. So I will see you everyone and uh, have a great day or your evening or your night, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. God bless you all. God bless you all.